Well, here's some food for thought. We are consumers. We consume food for our bodies when we're hungry. We consume tea and coffee when we need a pick-me-up. We consume news and information to understand what is going on. We use consuming language as well. When we're hungry, we say, I'm famished. When we read a good book, we'll say, I devoured it. And when you hear a sharp or a catchy idea, you say, here's some food for thought. Friends, welcome again to another Bible Talk in the Redeemer Queens Park community. Whoever you are, wherever you are, and whatever you're tuning in with, welcome. Redeemer is the place for you. Redeemer does exist to help connect Jesus to people, people to community, and community to mission. Last Saturday, we had maybe our best day yet as a church community. We had over 80 people around for church. We celebrated five baptisms and five stories of life change through Jesus Christ. I really wish you could have been there. We're gonna continue to bring these abbreviated Bible talks right here on these different social media platforms from week to week. But even today, I wish you were in the room with us as we're celebrating the Lord's Supper. We're taking communion together as a newly gathered church community. We'll continue bringing short synopsis versions of what we talk about on Saturdays in the room at Salisbury Primary School at 4 p.m. So let's go on and dive into this one right here. If you're looking for a title for the talk today, it's I am the bread of life. It's what Jesus said, but maybe more catchy for us is soul food. Soul food. We have hungry souls. We bring things into our lives because we have various forms of hunger. We bring food into our lives because we lack, we are hungry. We bring information in when we are ignorant and we need to understand. It's not only our stomachs and our minds that have their needs, our souls have needs as well. Our souls have their own cravings, their own longings, their own needs, and their own hunger. We have soul hunger. Soul hunger is evident in our emotions. It's evident in our reactions. Soul hunger is revealed in how we missed our friends and our family during the lockdowns of this last year. Soul hunger is why we lock on to people and we struggle to let go. Our souls have needs. Our souls have desires and cravings. We have soul hunger. And for our soul hunger, Jesus claims to be the bread of life. Soul food, the way that our souls are met, the way that our souls are nourished and satisfied. So here's a big idea for today. A full stomach or a full mind is temporary while a full soul will last forever. That's exactly what Jesus brings us in John chapter 6. It's where this encounter with Jesus takes place. It's the second most told story in the life of Jesus, traditionally known as the feeding of the 5,000. Let's go right into it. The first 15 verses, notice in verses 5 through 9, there's a bit of a tension developing. There's a problem and there's a question. Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, and he already knew what he was going to do. So he asked the question, where are we going to get bread? to feed this many people. Jesus looked at the crowds with compassion. Notice this about the Savior and King. Mark tells us that Jesus looked at the crowds with compassion. The Bible tells us that Jesus already knew what he was going to do, but Jesus was constantly seeking out the faith in the lives of his followers. So he struck up a conversation with this bloke named Philip, and then Andrew spoke up as well. Philip doesn't know what to do. He seemed overwhelmed with the details. Andrew found a possible solution, but didn't think it would do much good. The point is that Jesus was seeking out faith in the lives of his followers. In every situation, Jesus is trying to develop that inner potential of faith that's inside of of people. Jesus is constantly bringing his people into situations and giving them an opportunity to develop and to believe. Look at this sign that Jesus does in verses 10 to 13. About 5,000 men were there. You're left to assume maybe some women and children were around as well. It's hard for me to imagine 5,000 single dudes hanging out on the hill together. It's harder for me to imagine 5,000 dads getting a day pass. I'm imagining some moms and some kids and some other people are hanging around. And Jesus distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. 
Look, in typical non-dramatic, dramatic fashion, Jesus did the unthinkable. He had everyone sit down, and the author indicates that there are about 5,000, so maybe 12, 15,000 people are gathered around. And Jesus thanked his Father in heaven for providing for them. And then he simply began giving people food. And he kept giving, and he kept giving, and he kept giving, and the giving never ran out. The Bible says that everyone had enough to eat. They ate as much as they wanted. Think about this. Then Jesus, being very eco-conscious, he has everyone gather up the leftovers and he actually presents those to his followers. A take-home memento, so to speak, where they would take that basket with them and remember the abundant provision of Jesus. Perhaps they're even taking those baskets back into their own communities, back into their own homelands. And the bounty of Jesus was left for other people to be able to feast on as well. Today, Jesus does not sort of provide for us. Jesus provides for his people. Jesus provides for his church in super abundance. There's no barely getting by when it comes to the provision of this Jesus. Instead, there's following Jesus into a situation And you don't know how it's going to turn out. And God shows up and God provides for his people with super abundance. Now, this gets the crowd in an interesting place. The crowd responds and Jesus withdraws. That's what you see in verses 14 and 15. Jesus, the author tells us, knowing that they intended to come and make him a king by force, well, Jesus withdrew. Think about this. Jesus is the king who refused to become the people's king by force. People looks like they were, the people liked what they were seeing from Jesus. People liked what they were getting from Jesus. Just think about what you learn in the Gospel of John alone. First, Jesus shows up into a wedding and he turned vats of water into vats of good wine. Then he healed an official's son from 15 miles out. Then he healed a a man born crippled for 38 years, and now he's feeding some 12 to 15,000 people from the little boxed lunch from Sainsbury's. People were finding Jesus useful, but they were missing the real Jesus. They were missing the one to whom these signs pointed. See, Jesus is the giver, and the giver is always greater than the gifts. But the people around him, they wanted this one to be king for what they could get from him, not because of who he was in and of himself. You see, some people were following Jesus for what they could get, but Jesus won't have anything to do with it. You see, Jesus is looking for faith. Jesus is not looking for mere fascination. Jesus won't allow himself to be crowned king on our terms and on our conditions. The question for us then becomes, do you come to Jesus for who he actually is, or do you come to Jesus for something else? In verses 25 to 29, Jesus helpfully reveals the need of his people. You see, his followers had found him, and they began talking about what happened, and Jesus exposed the problem. Jesus said, the problem is that your taste buds were loving the bread so much, your stomachs were loving the bread so much, that you were missing me. The point is never the gift. The point is the giver of the gift, the Jesus who stands before them, able to provide for their hungry souls. So you're coming, Jesus is essentially saying, you're coming to me because I fed your hungry stomach, but there's another kind of hunger that I'm trying to help you feel. It's that soul hunger. So the text goes into a deep Q&A with Jesus. There's a long discourse throughout John chapter 6. They're asking questions, they're answering questions, but let's just roll it up into the big idea in verse 35. Jesus claimed to be soul food. Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. He makes what is hidden up until this point plain for all to see. It is no coincidence that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. The house of bread is prophesied hundreds of years before in Micah 5 2. The word became flesh and we broke that flesh. There is no coincidence about that either. This was all planned by our Lord for the redemption of our souls. So let's ease into this and let's try to hear and to trust and obey what God is saying to us through this beautiful chapter of Scripture. 
Our souls have a hunger that only Jesus can satisfy. So consider with me two massive soul-satisfying truths from John chapter 6. First, Jesus is the bread maker we've been waiting for. Here we see Jesus celebrating the feast of the Passover. He's celebrating these festivities as a Jewish man. This should lead our minds to think back on that first Passover. Years before, Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt in a mighty act of redemption by God. Jesus is intentionally repeating many of the Passover themes. The multitude of the people are not unlike the multitude in the desert. And Jesus fed these with heavenly bread. Following the feeding, Jesus walks on water before engaging in heady teaching. Even Jesus, Jesus' question in John 6 verse 5, it echoes Moses' question in Numbers eleven thirteen. Where can I find enough meat for all these people? Jesus is intentionally recreating it in their imagination. And he's fulfilling the images of Israel's past. The point emerges clearly. The hero of the Passover, it is not Moses. It's this Jesus. Jesus is the leader we've been waiting on. Better than Moses, Jesus doesn't simply call down bread from heaven. Jesus is the true manna sent from God. He can nourish our souls to eternal life. Jesus is this bread maker we have been waiting on. Let's receive him. And notice this, Jesus is soul food. This is the last idea, so let's be sure we chew it through. There's no middle ground when it comes to Jesus. Think about this. When you eat, you internalize the food. When you eat a piece of bread, you internalize the bread. So let's work this out. Thinking about eating is not the same as eating. Knowing nutritional facts is not the same as eating. Understanding how food is processed by the body is not the same thing as eating food. And to eat Jesus, you must believe in Jesus. You must rest your soul into Jesus. To have this bread, we have to consume. We have to believe in this one who is speaking. So to believe is to internalize truths about Jesus. It is to receive Jesus into your soul as you would receive bread into your stomach. So think about this, especially us church. Thinking about Jesus is not the same thing as believing in Jesus. Knowing facts about Jesus is not the same thing as believing in Jesus. And understanding how Jesus saves a person is not the same thing as being saved by Jesus. Believing in Jesus is about confessing that only Jesus can satisfy the emptiness inside of you. Only Jesus can quiet the growling of our hungry souls. It's a, it is as Augustine said, You, O oh Lord, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. One translation says, You have made us for yourself, O oh God, and our hearts find no peace until they rest in you. So how will you ever find peace for the growling in your soul? Was well, it's the same way you're able, only able to find food for your stomach. The only way you and I receive anything in our stomach is through death. For us to eat any amount of food, something has to die. If you're going to enjoy a hamburger, well, a cow has to die and a few grains of stock, wheat, wheat stock, they have to die as well. The only thing that we put into our bodies that doesn't require death is the occasional mineral. This is understood well when you live on a farm, but it's tough to see when you're standing in Tesco's. Jesus, Jesus is the bread. He is the bread given for the life of the world. In John chapter 10, Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his sheep. In John chapter 11, Jesus is the corn of wheat that falls into the ground and dies. And in John chapter 12, Jesus is the one who dies so that a nation and even the world may live. So here he is. He gives his flesh, the flesh of his body, to be the life of the world. If you're a Christian, this is about coming back to the basics. This is about feasting on Jesus, depending our souls into Jesus, receiving from Jesus and living. And if you're not a Christian and you're listening to this, consider the free offer. There's bread. What your souls have been longing for, there's bread. Receive this bread. As Psalm 34, 8 says, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. 
A full stomach or a full mind is temporary, but a full soul will last forever.